So, all right. Well, look, why don't I, uh, why don't I get us started? And, and by the way, I, I, uh, I, I think today's going to be a lot of fun, Greg. I, I think, I think this would be cool. I mean, I can tell you I'm personally psyched. Um, and, I, and I'm psyched because, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this on your behalf, Gray, I feel like we have the pro the project management guru for creative agencies. You're a pretty prolific guy in this space. And uh, obviously I'll give a chance. We'll both do intros here in a second, but let me at least tell folks why I think this is why I find this to be such a cool thing. And, and for those of you that like know us or know who we are upsource, you know, we're, we, we do CFO services for creative agencies. Um, and, and, you know, when we're doing our work, a, a big focus of what we do is gross margin, right? Like, are, are we making, how much money are we making on like the core delivery of service within this, within this, within this firm, 80 plus percent of the advisory we do is, is at gross margin. We do gross margin. Well, we can do everything else. Well, and, and ultimately, you know, gross margin, if I have a gross margin problem or opportunity, like it's pretty simple. There's like one of a couple of reasons why that might be the case, right? Either I have a utilization problem, i.e. I'm paying some people to do service that aren't doing service or I have a rate per hour problem, right? I'm the folks are doing service. I'm just not making enough money on an hourly basis from that work. But either way, the, here, here's the thing about it is like, we almost never find systemic problems with regard to rate per hour or or, or specific things. It's almost usually specific things. Like it's not all the projects, it's some of the projects, right? And so in our business, like when we get under the hood to try to help solve some of these problems, what we realize is it's a myriad of individual issues, right? It's this thing on this project, it's that thing on this project, it's this other thing on that other project. And, and all of these things together are culminating in the, 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 the unfortunate fact, which is we're not making money, right? And so Here's the thing. The myriad of those issues almost exclusively revolve around project management, right? Like it, it always comes down to project management. Can I scope correctly? Can I set expectations correctly? Can I delegate those expectations to my team effectively? Can we manage progress? And most importantly, can we triage things when they fall off the rails? And so anyways, this is why I think this is cool. This is why I'm excited to have you join us, Gray, is because the things that you do, you can help us fix those problems or prevent those problems from ever happening, right? And so that's where, like that. This is the this is the yin to our yang on our engagement. So anyway, I've got Gray McKenzie as in pilot. He's the guy. He's the project management guru. Gray, welcome. Very happy to have you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I'm uh, pumped to go through this. It's been yeah. a lot of time in this space, you know, like a uh, ex agency owner. You know, we started uh, an agency back in 2011. So it's, yeah, well, uh, go ahead and do, why don't you roll into it? Give us your, I gave you, I gave folks the preamble for why I think Gray's awesome, but yeah, give us like your full, your full, yeah. uh, yeah, your intro. Who are you? Who's Zen, who's Zen Pilot? Yeah, super quickly. So, uh, Zen Pilot, um, we lead agencies through the last project management implementation they'll ever need. Project management implementation sounds like the tool. Hey, we're going to plug in this specific tool or that specific tool. And it's much more than the tool itself. And what's the whole system around how we do project management? Um, that, I mean, if you think about it, like running, running and leading and managing projects well is like the fundamental thing, uh, at the heart of every agency. That's why it is what we do. This is why we get all the other functions around it. <laughs> exactly. It's almost 100% the business. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is the heart of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm one of the co-founders at Zen Pilot, myself, my business partner, Andrew, you know, we're ex agency founders, um, who made all the mistakes, struggled through all this. Uh, we've worked with almost 3000 agencies now over the last decade, um, of coaching and training and consulting uh, with firms to fix a lot of those project management problems. And so we're just trying to help agency owners and teams kind of take all the chaos that's naturally associated with agency life and convert it to clarity so they can make better decisions. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about kind of like what are the three key pieces yeah. of solving yeah. project management, but that's kind of the super, super quick high level intro from Zen Pilot. Uh, cool. Ron, I'll let you, if you want to talk about upsourced and in yeah. the context for folks who aren't familiar already, love to hear that too. Yeah, totally. Happy to do it. Okay, so quick uh, intro. Obviously, I'm Ryan. I'm one of the founding partners here at Upsourced. Um, Upsourced, I think, simplest way to describe us, of course, is that we're an accounting firm for marketing agencies. I'll say that's a little bit of a misnomer, and I say that because traditional accounting firms are mostly doing compliance work like auditor tax. We don't touch either of those things, right? 100% of what we do is the accounting and the financial strategy for creative agencies. So, you know, I often say our, our services are in like two buckets. One bucket is we organize the financial and non-financial data agencies need to make decisions. And the second thing we do is we join the leadership team and we sit side by side with those agency owners and we help them use that data to make decisions. So anyway, we've got, um, we, we've been around for over, you know, over a decade, 11 or 12 years at this point. 
Um, we've got over a hundred marketing agencies and I haven't, I don't haven't counted, but I think almost all the States at this point. Um, and, and just a quick, I actually came from an agency background myself. So before my role here, I was in the CFO, COO operating chair, uh, for a, um, for an influencer marketing and media agency that we, uh, that we ultimately sold. So got a lot of empathy for both sides of the, uh, of the fence. By the way, my, I'm going to let my dog out. He's sad Love it. being in my uh, office. So anyway, That's awesome. Right. I look, yeah. So, <laughs> you know. The joys of working from home. So anyway, um, so that's upsourced. Um, so let's get into it. Um, and 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 Gray, I know, like obviously, I mentioned this in some of my promotion. Like you gave me a little bit of a sneak preview of some of the things that you had a chance to show. And maybe I'm just a dork, but I, I'm like super excited to hear you'd go through this. Uh, but before we go there, right before we pull up the technology and we get into like the 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 tactics, I I would love your you know obviously like all of us service providers, we have kind of like a methodology or philosophy we like to use when it comes to like, how do we do our thing? And so I'd be interested to know, like, what's your, what's your philosophy? Like, what's the methodology? What are the guiding principles? Like, how do you think about project management, like from a high level, like how agencies should apply it in order to be successful? Yeah. So I'll, I'll tackle this from a couple different things. I think first of all, like we, talk a ton. Anyone who's a client of ours is probably sick of hearing about like this one, three, five formula. But the target, like I mentioned earlier, is to create clarity for everyone. And when we th think about clarity for everyone, we're talking about like, I want clarity at the exec la layer. That's what you're talking about. Hey, we take yeah. all the numbers and we walk you through how to make decisions around. More so tell you the decisions. We tell you, here's what the numbers are. Here's you know what, what we've seen success with the other folks. You've got to make the decision about what's, what's right for you. Yep. But that's going to be the exec layer. It's like, hey, here's what your PL says. Here's what, you know, you've got a utilization problem and you got to figure out how to go fix that. So you either got to sell more, or you got to right size your, yep. your team or whatever. Yep. Uh, but if you think about the entire organization, that clarity is like, that's what everybody's after. So if I'm an account manager at a firm somewhere, like I need to know what is the health of each of my projects going on right now? How's my team doing? Who's got capacity? Who doesn't have capacity? I take yep. stuff on. And if we go down the stack, even farther to the individual contributor layer. You know, I want to know what's on my plate kind of day by day. What are the priorities and how exactly do I do I do that work the right way for the organization? So that's what we're after. The three key pieces there are the tools that we use, the processes that we employ, and the habits that our team follows so that everyone in the organization does work the right and best way every time. So you asked the question about like what's the methodology? And I think this is yeah. a starting point for pretty much everybody is we're going to have some methodology around how we're going to do project management. Yeah. And most folks don't really think about, I mean, it's natural in your world. Like everyone's on a, Hey, we're either accrual based or sure. we're cash based. It's like, yeah, hey, yeah. we got to define some of the parameters here before we even get started. Yep. yep. Uh, if you think about running a sales org and CRM and think about like, Hey, how do we attack tasks? Most folks will say, Hey, we've got different levels of priority. Some people call this stacking. And yep. the stuff that's closest to closing, so if someone's in solution presented or contract sent, any tasks related to that come out first. And the farther we get away from it, you know, then we move down to what's in the sales process, what's scheduled the first time appointment, and then what's pre kind of conversation, sometimes called left of deal. Like those are the, uh, there's there's a methodology that all the most effective sales teams use. Yeah. And the same thing, same thing should be true in terms of a delivery team or client services team. Like what's our methodology of project management? So you've got, you know, conventional waterfall uh, approaches. You've got agile approaches. And it's yep. so funny talking to folks who run sprints because everybody says there's not one company out there that runs and says, hey, we run conventional sprints. Everyone says, oh, I've got some weird you know, way that we've hacked agile together <laughs> sure, to, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. to be our, our own, methodology. Our own brand. Yeah. Um, so I think every agency needs to decide on that first. And and like by far the most popular approach. Um, and I think what's what's the best approach for the majority of agencies is certainly not for everybody, is just to define like, hey, are we gonna have you know a due date driven methodology? It's like what's been most successful for most agencies, unless they're a hardcore agile shop and they actually take that seriously. So yeah, I think that's a long way of saying yeah. that's that's the we've got to have some sense of saying if we're gonna give clarity to everybody, how do we decide what gets done when and what's what's the priority matrix that we use? Um, and how do we plan that out? And so having a due date, the conventional D U E date. Yeah. And then that hopefully also coordinates to your due date, D O date. Uh-huh. Uh, 
those two things playing together. And we can walk through some examples of what that looks like. But I think that's the starting yeah. point is just figuring out what's what's the methodology we want to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, okay, got it. So bottom line is like lots of different ways that I could structure this, but at this at its core, right? I, we, we've got to figure out like what is it we need to accomplish and who's doing it and by when, right? And we need to organize those in some sort of way that everybody's aligned, right? Everybody on our team is is quite clear. So I guess I have a couple follow up questions, and and feel free at any point to show. Uh, in addition to tell, but I'll let you decide when when's the best way to do that. Um, so that sounds simple enough, right? Like, you know, part of me, an easy reaction would be like, no shit, Greg. Like, yeah, of course. But like, it's hard. Yep. <laughs> this is the number one reason that, that people struggle. I mean, I, I, I can just tell you that this is, we always hit this point where it's like, look, we have a profitability problem and it ultimately lives in project management. So let me ask you the first question. Why is it so hard? Like, what, what, what do you think is the reason that, it, that despite the fact that like, oh yeah, of course, I just need to take what I am and be very clear about when it's due and who owns it and when they're going to do it, that we ultimately struggle. What, what makes this, what, what falls apart? What makes this hard? Yeah. I think it all starts at the beginning. I mean, just like any relationship, like the key to any successful relationship is setting clear expectations and then meeting those consistently. Yeah. And when you don't set clear expectations, it's super hard to meet them because everyone fills in the blanks. So scoping is the single kind of initial uh, cause of all this. Like, hey, we've got poorly defined scopes of work or what we're going to do uh, in a lot of firms. And yeah. if that's, and so you just kind of like follow the, you know, follow the breadcrumbs. If it's not a scoping issue, if we've actually matured and now we do a good job scoping, it's either hey, we're aligned or aligned around these metrics, or we're aligned about hours of work, or we're aligned about deliverables, or you know, whatever that um, kind of systematic way that we scope yeah. is. Uh, we're selling things more as products, and we've moved into a productized motion. Uh, that's fine. Then the next place where things fall down is taking that scope of work and actually translating it into an act, actual project plan inside of your project management system. So if I pull up, um, let's see, let's just grab, we'll jump into, we've got some folks here who are on ClickUp. We've got some folks who are on Teamwork. We'll jump into um, ClickUp as an example. So I've got a client, I've got whatever my specific project is for them, you know, our 2023 planning is like the, the broad tail thing. Well, how do we get if I go look at most people's project management system, what it looks like is not kind of a, I'll just hide subtasks here for a second or collapse them all. It doesn't look like this where I've got, you know, here's a whole campaign that we're running and this is duplicated for every campaign that we're running. And then there's, you know, the set of kind of systematic subtasks that needs to happen. Um, it looks more like, maybe it looks like this, the very top level view mm -hmm. without breaking down, but it's almost always a lack of granularity in terms of planning. Because that feels like, hey, I'd rather just do the work. And the challenge is, as you bring more and more people in, uh, it's super hard when not all the yeah. work is centralized in one place to actually know what's going on and meet those expectations. Because the reality is, we think as entrepreneurs and as owners, like, yeah, hey, I just give you the project, you run with it and make it happen. Exactly. And then yeah, we yeah. get frustrated when you deliver it differently than we would have delivered it because we never <laughs> defined the process. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting. Uh, I mean, that's a that's an interesting point. I think one maybe I'm even guilty of, and 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 I'd say one, one an area. Um, and I might be restating some of what you just said, but I feel like one of the cl classic areas. Let's just assume that, for instance, we've got agencies that are they they have figured out how to scope to some degree, right? I've got an owner. They I, I see a project, and they can they have somehow figured out. Let me rephrase. Maybe not. They may not be doing an amazing job at like scoping from the standpoint of defining all the very specific things that need to be done. But like a decent job of deciding, like roughly, this is what it's going to take for us to be able to meet their objectives and deliver. Right. Anyway, I often see it break down when it moves from the proposal stage to the execution stage. Things get yep. lost in transom. Right. What was clear in the biz dev teams brain, whether that's just the seller, the owner, or some small you know, strike team, uh, what was clear there just falls apart in terms of delivery, right? And so, and I suspect this is a classic area where you fall. So let, I guess the question I would ask is, how do you overcome that? Like, and maybe what I'm asking is like, whose job is it to make sure we don't do that, right? Whose job is it? You mentioned, you often see very, uh, uh, very broad tasks and not very specific tasks. So like within the agency who owns this job? Yeah, great question. I think ultimately, 
this falls to, so I, I look at an agency. Tell me if you disagree with this, right? I look at an agency and I see three main functions. You get growth, like mm-hmm. who's going to, how are we growing the business, the marketing, the sales, Yep. delivery, which is who's then keeping the promises that growth made um, and yep. delivering client services. And then operations. And this is probably where I simpl- oversimplify things too much for uh, an accountant um, <laughs> sure, and sure. CFO to yeah. say like, Hey, this is the, this is the junk drawer of the business world. This is like yep. HR, people, culture, finance, totally. uh, yeah, legal, yeah. All, all that kind yeah. of stuff. I think that's a fine description. Yeah. Ops. Yeah. So uh, that delivery, who's in charge of delivery? Uh, that's the person who ultimately is responsible for this system um, and making sure that this works well um, internally. They're going to need resources from other folks and they may delegate some of the day-to-day management of this to someone else. Yeah. But this is the person who is reviewing client health scores on a weekly basis. Yeah. They're the person who's responsible for taking those scopes of work and translating them into the system. And that doesn't mean most of the time in most firms that we work with, they are not actually the ones doing all of that. Yeah. They're the ones who are responsible for that system and then delegating who does it and making sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Would you say, yeah, I think that makes sense. And so you know, I, I would I would tend to agree, I guess, from a delivery standpoint, whether that's, uh, you know, one main individual or not, you know, in ter- so you've got the delivery person, they're responsible for making sure that we, we adequately, you know, uh, adequately define what needs to get done. And obviously, in order to do that, they've got to learn what is in what is in the head of the folks who who did the sales would you say that more commonly you see a successful uh, execution of this just the you know in a post sort of pre onboarding post sales close these two are just meeting of the minds and they're you know trying to the this, the delivery person is just trying to get all the information they possibly can or would you say that you'd want to have your delivery person more embedded into the sales process and like in the meetings and part of the scoping, like which, which of those two outcomes do you feel is most successful? Yeah, the former. And I'll just show you kind of what I think that this probably ought to look like. Okay. Um, and this will be, we'll, we'll tackle this anyways in a kind of a separate segment here. So I, the reason that I think that they, I just don't think it's the best use of their time to be in the sales process. If you've got a mature or early on, or if you do everything that you do is custom, you're not going to get around bringing some of your delivery yeah. folks into either the sales process or into a paid discovery yeah. or scoping uh, engagement. Yeah. But um, but if you're more productized, hey, we're consistently selling website projects and sure. marketing retainers. Um, I don't think that's a good use of their time to be in the sales process. There should be good parameters. If we're somewhat mature, our sales team knows what they can sell and how they need to sell it, and that gets handed off. I even uh, don't love. That most teams do, I think this would be super controversial. Most teams then do, if they do anything at all, I guess maybe most teams don't actually have a a clear defined handoff process. But if they do, it's usually a live call and it's a head of delivery who likely is not doing almost any work on the actual account uh, in the sales rep. And sometimes the account manager is brought in as well. And so what I like is kind of every project um, or client, depending on how you're, you know, some folks work with multiple multiple projects per client, but is tracked on some kind of, this is in, inside ClickUp. We could build this in anything. I like having it in your PM tool natively, but you could build this inside Google Sheets or Excel or wherever else too. Yep. And it's what's the project? Uh, you know, Where are we in the process of that project? What's the health of that account? What services are they getting? What was the goal in the client's words? Yep. Uh, who's, who's leading that account? Who sold that account? There's a whole bunch of other properties we can get into, but kind of the, the core basic stuff. And then what I want is this gets handed off from sales and there's either a loom video walking through. There probably is a combination of, Hey, all the fields that we've asked for to get filled out are either filled out here or they'll mm-hmm. filled out. We'll go back for a second and we'll pop open this one. Actually we'll open this in a new tab. Um, so I want kind of an overview uh, let's see if we have any, looks like we don't have one in here, but like an overview doc for that. Yeah. Specific yeah, yeah. Client. yeah. Yeah. I got you. Yep. Yeah. You know, I'm putting in, I'm filling out all this kind of this information. Is the intake. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, so some There's combination no- of like fields that need filled out and then look, here's a loom overview. Here's the, the recap of what happened in the sales process. Here's what is, is unique about this client and what they're really motivated for. And that then lives on this record. So in a comment thread here, we've got kind of an ongoing thread of what's happening like at a high level with this account. Um, and then that context is there for account managers change or someone else gets brought in and they need to get up to speed quickly on the project. 
it's a lot better to have that recorded somewhere than to have it in a, you know, a live meeting that you just kind of have to keep repeating. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I, a couple of things. One, I, I love the idea of, um, you know, a lot, I see a lot of folks using sort of like the, um, the just text-based intake forms, you know, clearly defining, there's a lot of advantage, a lot of advantage to that. And I think that's good, but I love the loom video. It's a thing that I know that you, you adopt a lot. Even you and I working together, you use loom a lot. Um, yeah. we see that some, but maybe less frequently, but I really like that because it, it, it allows for more, um, subjectivity. It allows for things that don't cleanly fit into these things. I mean, a question that you even mentioned just now, well, I'm going to rephrase it, but, um, you know, just getting to the idea of not what they're buying, but why they're buying, right? Like that you may, you may be an agency that produces websites as like one of your core products, but there may be four or five different reasons why somebody would choose your firm in order to do the website. And the reason they chose you is a really, really key fact to find yeah. it, to, to being able to meet or exceed their expectations and that's, I mean, you can certainly fit that into, you know, an intake form and, and, and I'm not suggesting I wouldn't recommend it, but like having a loom and having one of these sort of like, not just conversations, but documented conversations we can all refer back to super helpful. I, I think that's yeah. a, I think it's a cool idea. Yep. Um, so real quick. Okay. So I, I want to, uh, you, you brought up something that I want to come back to like all this whole dashboard about client health scores and NPSs and stuff like very cool. Let me put a pin in that here for one second and go back to maybe the, um, the the more sort of tactical, like how are we managing the work to be done versus the sort of outcome or satisfaction of how we did the work. So going back to how we did the work, okay, so we, we talked a little bit about, you know, okay, how might we take a project, organize the work to be done? How granular do we get it? Whose job is it? To, to create that, right? So let's just assume for a second that we've we figured it out, right? We've we've taken a project, we've got it all well documented. It's in teamwork, it's in ClickUp, it's wherever it is, and now we're ready to go. Like it's time to it's time to um, it's time to to do the work. Talk to me about like how what's the best way, either philosophically or just use the tools, like to manage this work on an ongoing basis. Like what am I? What am I looking at? What am I holding ourselves accountable to? What am I tracking here? Right. Does that, does that question make sense? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's say both sides. So I'm going to hit these all super quickly. We could do an entire hour just on any of these. Sure. Sure. First things first, we've got whatever we're doing for a new client kind of planned out. You know, what's our flow of, Hey, here's how we do onboarding and what's our process for how we're doing that. And what are the the checklists or steps? Yep. We've got that. We've got a typical timeline mapped out. We know what services they need. And ideally, these are kind of modular templates in whatever tool you use. You use Teamwork. They've got great task templates. ClickUp's got it. Monday's got it. Asana's got, you know, like everyone's got task templates. Uh, so we're able to deploy either like the high-level client folder or we're able to deploy, deploy like, hey, they're adding in this piece of the project or this deliverable or whatever. So we're building that out. You know, we're pulling from our templates to go grab whatever that is. We're calling it whatever we're remapping the due dates and we're, we're getting the whole project kind of set up. Yeah. So that's step one is we've got to get tasks into the system. The number one yep. rule of project management for pretty much every firm should be, if it's not in fill in the blank of your project management yeah, right. platform, it didn't happen. Yeah. Totally. Uh, and that's going to be that. across. Hey, you want yep. credit for something that you did? Uh, like this is just a rule of working here is yep. you, you're not allowed to decide, Oh, I want to manage my stuff on Slack while everyone else has to live inside teamwork. Like that's not, yep. that's not going to fly. Yep. So everything gets into the system. We've got the methodology defined. So everything's going to get a due date. It's going to have an assignee and it's going to have, if we're trying to do workload, you know, it's going to have a time estimate tied to it. Uh, if you don't care about workload management or you manage workload differently, totally fine to scrap that. And you might have other requirements that you need. Hey, I need these other fields filled in or not. Anyways, so we get all the work into the system is step one. Step two is how are, are we going to visualize that? So whatever your platform at some global layer. I need to be able to see across all projects, across all clients, across all departments of the org, what's on my plate in a day-to-day -day basis based on kind of what's, if we're using a due date methodology, what's due farthest in the past to what's due today to what's due tomorrow to what's due, you know, farther in the future. And that should be kind of the running list of what we've got. Yep. You may also have, you'll probably have, you can see here, there's a secondary priority. So due date is great, but I've got 13 tasks to do today like which ones are the most important ones. Um, so you may have a secondary priority matrix as well, but we'll kind of ignore that for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's work into the system. So now we've got stuff planned. 
we've got it showing up for people. They're working through it in the day-to-day. In any methodology that you have, there's some weak spot or soft spot where stuff goes to die and goes to slip through the cracks. Yep. So in this methodology, as soon as I've got this task to go do on my plate and whoops, I accidentally removed the due date on it, then it's gone. Or, you know, I'm feeling lazy yep. and I don't really want to do this one. So I'm just going to bump it. I'm not going to tell anybody that I bumped it, but I yep. moved it. Yep. Like there's, or I, whoops, I, you know, I removed an assignee and I forgot to re-add one. And so it, yep. it's gone or whatever. So you need the accountability from somebody in the organization. And so this is often a project manager. Um, sometimes it's the head of deliver, but usually this will get delegated to somebody else. And there's four main habits that we'll talk about, but specifically here, the, like the single main habit to catch most of this stuff is a daily spot check. Okay. And let me see if I've got an example of what that looks like, just so you can see, uh, have a quick example of what types of stuff goes into that. I don't know if I've got one in here. Uh, that's all process building stuff. Uh, anyways, I could, I can quickly walk through what goes into that. So, um, first of all, I'm looking either on a report or through these yep. different views, you can see, you know, Hey, I want to see what got closed without time or yep, yep, whatever yep. else. Usually this would be through a dashboard. I just want to see what tasks don't have an assignee, what tasks don't have a due date, what tasks are overdue, what tasks got due dates moved, but there was no comment. Nobody left a trail of like what actually happened here. Um, so somebody, this is like a super important task, but not a very strategic, not a super high level task. This should be by somebody um, whose time is less valuable is running through and running that daily spot check. They're then producing a weekly roundup, which is kind of a summary of those trends and issues and giving that to the leadership team. Um, and so those first two habits, the daily spot check and the weekly roundup, those are really like activity-based reports. Yep. The second two habits, monthly review, quarterly analysis would be a lot more tied to what you all are doing. And yep. that would be, hey, now let's look at the results of that stuff. How is that impacting you know, our profitability or our, um, you know, what does our utilization look like yep. or deliver margin or what clients or projects or service lines are most profitable, least profitable, that kind of stuff. Cool. Love that. All right. Let me, let me, uh, let me, I'm going to hit one, one follow-up question before yep. I do that real quick, just as a heads up, a couple folks are putting Q and A's in here. Love it. Keep doing that. I've got a couple queued up. I'm going to shoot your way gray here, but before I do that, I just want to, I don't want to lose the thread here. So I, I, um, so I love this idea of, and I totally agree, like having some sort of like uh, some sort of monitoring function, whomever it is, head of ops or or wh whatever that person's role is to make sure that like we're maintaining what I would describe as compliance in this system, right? Like right. we're, we're the, the texts are here. We're not just sort of haphazardly moving them. We don't have things without, you know, past due tasks is a thing that I know a number of folks are, you know, look at consistently, like no, no, no past due tasks at the end of the day. But I also know that we have a number of clients who struggle Yep. Um, with, and <laughs> I'll admit that we struggle with this too, which is having folks that despite the fact that like we have a rule, no past due tasks straight up, like at the end of every day, certainly at the end of every week, no past due tasks. But you know, that person whose job it is to make sure that we are maintaining compliance, they've always got work to do. Doesn't matter every single day, they've always got work to do. And so I guess my question to you is, is that a feature or a bug, right? Like how do you, you know, how do you manage that? Or is that just, just always going to happen? That's why the person's job is to do that, right? Like what's your, What's your yeah. take on s folks who are good or sometimes not as good at playing by the rules within the system? How do you handle that as an agency owner? Right. So I think it should always have, if we're ambitious, which everybody on here is. I think that's right. Yep. We're always going to bite off a little bit more than we can chew. So yeah. if we're like one of the key metrics I would look at is velocity rate. We can talk about how we measure that, but basically What's the amount of work that we put, what percent of the work that we plan for the week actually gets done over the course yeah. of the week? Um, ideal is 100%, right? Like we're perfect at planning. But the reality is if it's 100%, you know, are we really pushing ourselves enough? That probably yep. shouldn't be 100%. Uh, it should certainly be 80% plus if we're, you know, one of the key skills in any business, uh, in anything in life is the ability to predict. And so we want to get as good as we can at predicting work. Um, and knowing, and because we're telling clients and we're making predictions to clients about when stuff is going to get done, that's super important. I've got a lot less, uh, patience or grace towards folks who are over promising on deadlines. And, you know, 80% is not good enough. If we hit 80% of client deadlines, that's not a good experience for clients. Yeah. If we hit 80% of, Hey, what are all the things that we'd like to do, um, yeah. over the course of a week. And some of those things are internal stuff that we're trying to move the ball forward. 
on, that means, hey, we're an ambitious crew who's who keeps biting off more than we can chew. So that should be trending upwards. So how do I deal with it then when we get to the end of the day and folks have stuff that's not updated? The reality is that you are going to have to change. I, there's no point leaving due dates in the past in any system, if you're, especially totally if you're agree. doing any yep. kind of workload. Yep. So I agree, 100% about. agree with your rule. The key thing is when you're moving a due date on something, you need to make sure that you're leaving a trail of what happened and communicating to anybody who's impacted by that. Hey, Ryan, your client expected this. I know you told him you thought me you might have that to them today. Like I, I did not get to it. I ran out of time. I'll have it to him by whatever 10 a.m. in the morning. Yep. That bumps up in that secondary metric, uh, like um, way that we prioritize. So that becomes a higher priority for me the next day. Got to make it. sure that I get it done to you. Um, but that's the like that's the workflow, and that's what we're looking for. Yeah. From that compliance officer. I like that secondary. Uh metric or whatever the 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 ability yep. to me- to measure priority okay that's cool all right i dig it thank you all right so um real quick uh we've got a couple of questions i do want to hit and then I'll, and then we can sort of transition to the other half of the equation which is like client satisfaction and and how, how are we maintaining the outcomes okay so um here's a so I got a couple of questions uh, and we'll hit these, you know, relatively quickly, Greg. Um, okay. Let me answer the first question. The first question is really related to um, it's a, it's, it's adjacent to project management. I think it's helpful, which is, Hey, I'm trying to think about whether or not to bring on uh, a person, right? What metrics should I look at? Whether I want to hire in this case, a part-time person uh, in other cases, a full-time person uh, I've got opinions, but I'd be interested. What, what do you think? Yeah, I'll go first and then you'll, you'll come in and correct me, which is great. So I don't, <laughs> Like, I think the standard answer to this would be, and this is great context that, you know, this person is a PMA, ideally they're 60% billable. And I'll just fill in the blanks with like, hey, I think when they're coming on, they're 40% billable or, or something. Yeah, yeah. And people are going to give an answer, like the the way that I would have answered this question five years ago with a little bit less um, nuance would have been, no, like you got to get them to 50% billable once they're there, then go ahead and, you know, make the call and take them from part-time to full-time. Yeah. The nuance that I've added... Um, just by seeing a lot more agency scenarios is this doesn't live in a vacuum by itself. Like what's your margin and what's the upside of bringing this person in? So if we're looking at your net margin and your net margins at 4%, I'm like, no, actually that threshold has got to be higher for, you know, you've got to have enough bill work to bring somebody in full time. But if we're looking at your net margin and you're at, you know, 30%, say, Hey, you've got a lot more room here to make the decision that you want to make. If you love having this person in, that's going to free up. You, know, you can you're just a lot uh, better equipped to invest in growth. And if so, if this is part of growing what you do and hiring out ahead of uh, ahead of need or something, I don't have a problem with it in that yeah. in that way. So that's that's probably not that's like the classic it depends answer. But that's what I would be looking. Yeah, at. Yeah, I think that's right, though. I mean, look, I, I, I think I would say I would use different words to communicate largely the same message. I mean, I, we obviously take a little bit more of like a quantitative formulaic approach, which is, I mean, again, we're we're going to start with like, you know, we're we're, we're going to start with what is our what, what is our margin, like what is our target margin, and then generally for all of our roles, we're going to have utilization thresholds, right? Like. Yep on the high end and the low end, right? If 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 our utilization for that particular role falls below a certain amount, or in other words, we have excess capacity, then we have too many people and we may actually be looking to downsize that team. And on the other side, we have a utilization threshold, right? Where if our team is at or above whatever that number is for the role and it changes for a role, then we now don't have enough capacity to do the things that we want, including sell ahead, right? And so that utilization threshold, as you mentioned, is going to be very contextual based on the role itself and the work to be done, how how strategic the role is, how hard it is, how long it takes to hire that person, and also like how much cash do we have in the bank and what are our goals, right? And so we may be able, we may be in a position or we may desire to hire a person well ahead of demand. And in other cases, we may only be in a position to hire when it really hurts. And so you know, again, I think there's a couple of other questions to answer about, you know, where we are. Uh, but, but ultimately, um, as you mentioned, I, th- I think it's a little bit nuanced. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Here's another good one. Uh, same person. Um, the, um, billable targets. So utilization targets or billable percent targets for PMs or AMs. Yeah, this is a great one. Do you want to take the first stab at this one, Ryan? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I may be in a little bit of a semantic, like, so let me also say, and and 
let me caution by saying benchmarks are dangerous because <laughs> like, you know, we like to paint with a broad brush. I love to say like agency, you know, when gross margin, we like to say, oh, I think agencies can do like 50 to 55% margin, but I've got some agencies who can do well over 60 and some who are under 40 and both of them can earn a good net margin. So benchmarks are, 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 are dangerous, but at least for us, we, we look at utilization in the project, like in terms of the, the total service delivery, as well as the total firm, like on the, the total firm, we like to see utilization or billability either way of, um, of, you know, call it in the 60, 65%. And that includes some of our ops people. Some, we may have agencies who are lower, some are higher. And on the, on the ops, on the, on the delivery side, very, very much depends on the role, but in general, it ends up being blended between 70 and 80%. I would say like, I, I, my answer to this question would be a little bit of, of, I'm a little bit lost in the semantics only because um, you, you, this person mentioned that our agency has a goal to be 30% of a project. And when I read that, I think I would think a PM or an AM would be spending more than 30% of their time on a project. In fact, I would think the majority of their time would be on a project. And so maybe I'm getting lost in the semantics, but I, I would say at least if I'm thinking about how, what percentage of the AM or PM's time is devoted to a project – whether or not you're explicitly billing for their time in that project or not, I, I would I would see that number to be relatively north of that. Like again, I see lots of 70s, sometimes, you know, in the 60s, sometimes a little bit more. So anyway, but again, I, I might be getting lost in the semantics. What what do you think, uh, Greg? I also don't know how to read this. If this is like, hey, I want 30, no more than 30% of our time goes towards managing the project or doing strategy on it versus deliverables. It could be that. This also could be that. We're actually just shooting for a utilization rate of 30% for PMM, which is kind of my initial read, which I would doubt is accurate. But if it is, yep. there's cases, I'm sure you've seen this as well. Uh, agencies tend to be like one of these weird businesses where we think that time spent managing the project, but not actually like doing the work we shouldn't bill for. So if I spend time replying to an email, we don't bill for, you know, like, there's all kinds yep. of, agency yeah. situations where I've run into that and that just doesn't fly in pretty much any I, other profession and doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Yeah. Um, so that'd be like the red flag that I'd watch out for here is we should be billing for the time that it, that we're spending uh, project managing, account managing, et cetera. I, I see. Um, okay. Gotcha. I'm going to hit the rest of this question offline. The individual cool. yep. uh, give a clarification, but okay. Um, real quick. I, I'm going to keep going on some of these questions. There's a couple, there's a couple more I want to grab real fast. Um, one actually I want to, I want to jump to, and then I'm going to do the other two at the end. The one I want to jump to is a really interesting question that I'd love your answer on. Uh, cause it's tricky, which is, um, how do you handle tasks where, you know, this, the question is how do you deal with tasks where the time estimate is low, but it's something that requires a lot of follow-ups to complete. So I guess I would maybe, I would rephrase that and to say, it's not necessarily the time estimate is low, but it's hard to estimate, right? Like it's yeah. a high degree of variability, um, and, and we face that and a lot of our, our clients face that. So how do you, how do you handle that? What, what's your take on that, Gray? I've got two different things. First one is that this is the beauty of averages. I'm sure you're used to this. Do you ask uh, anybody yeah. like, what's the average of whatever? And the answer yeah. to any, anytime you ever ask that question is, well, it depends. Sometimes it can be as high as this, sometimes it can be as low as this. No, the yeah. question I asked is what is the average? Like, please give me, you know, <laughs> what's the average amount of time. So if you track this well, you can figure this out. Someone else asked a question about like, what if we only do digital media? You know, it's very yeah. service uh, oriented and it depends on what the clients want. That's all fine. But over a large enough, you know, it's a lot of large numbers over a large enough sample size, we can make some pretty, this is how insurance works. Like what are the chances that my specific house burns down? You know, I don't, it could be high, it could be low. Like, yeah, but sure, what's sure, the average sure. across a, a, large, right, right, right. a large enough sample size? Um, so if we track this well, we'll be able to do a better job of estimating how much total time goes into this. And there's totally a differentiate a, di a difference between a process that looks like this client onboarding and 99% yep. of the time it runs exactly the same. It is exactly. Yeah. You know, yep. Down Little to a standard T. deviation. Yep. Versus stuff that is uh let's see if there's a good example here but you know web anything branding anything where there's a lot of client revision and input yep. um, is going to look a lot different and that's why you're going to see things like in a template we're kind of pre preparing for that. So if we do a website page design. Um, you know, we've got individual tasks and somewhere down here, you know, revision, we've got different rounds of revisions yep. that are pre-planned into what's going to happen. Yep. If we don't need to do them, that's great, but wow. we know it's likely coming. Let's just plan for the variables that we yep. know are coming and give yep. ourselves enough, enough room and bandwidth to be prepared for it. 
And, and just to be clear, I think I'm stating the obvious, but you would agree that these are dynamic, right? It's not as if we plan, we scoped it from the beginning and it's like, well, we have, we plan for the second round. So we're just going to leave that in there forever. Right. Right. As we learn more. And I think that's, that's often what happens in these situations as we learn more, you know, the click up teamwork, whatever your tool is becomes gospel. Sure. We update it, we revise, we replan. This is an iterative process. It's not a one and done process. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to realize, Hey, there's like a super standard, super detailed checklist uh, process stuff. And then we get the stuff that, Hey, this is our first time that we've done it. So we know yep. the general shape of it. We've got the high yep. level deliverables and milestones that we need to hit. We have no idea how we're actually going to get there. And so we've got yeah, to cool. be prepared and have a way to manage that. Love it. Okay. I'm going to go back to the content. Cause I, I, I don't want to lose this. Actually it's already up on the screen. So uh, w- w- that's a great segue, which is, um, again, I, I think, so we talked a lot about like, again, the, the mechanics of how do I do the work but then there's the whole motion around, you know, broadly speaking, account management. Like, how do we make sure that we are delivering and delighting our customers? And and how are we how are we viewing that, monitoring that, managing that, whatever? And you've got this really cool. You showed this to me like a couple of days ago, and I, I I loved it. It was a really cool view for me as like you know me as an executive, also me as a head of delivery to just see at a glance. Where are we? How are we doing? Where am I worried, right? Where are my risks? And so I guess maybe what I would say, Gray, is like walk us through this view here and maybe yeah. spend a couple of seconds on each one, particularly the health score. I, health score probably re- requires the most uh, explanation. Like tell me what is the health score? Yep. Like how do I develop it? Who does that? What that like? And, and then MPS for those that are less familiar, you know, spend a little time on that too. But anyways, cool. give us an overview of this. Yeah. So this ties into a couple of questions that people had earlier, which is like, hey, what are the metrics I should be looking at and managing across my projects and, and team? Yeah. Because so we can talk about those. We talked about some of the financial pieces, your utilization, your margin, your profitability by client, by uh, service line, by team. We talk about velocity rate and some of the leading indicators of how we're executing on work as an internal team. Yep. But the single most important metric for most teams uh, around retaining their clients is like what's the health and and creating more referrals and you know the positive flywheel that we all want is what's the health of our clients um, yep. and so you got a handful of different variations that people use some folks will go crazy and they've got the one to ten score of how clients are doing some folks will use like the traffic light system red yellow uh-huh. green yeah and probably my favorite variation is the one to five uh, matrix and this is in this case this simple example of it this is purely an internal uh, grade. And so it's standardized for the team. A five means, so scale of one to five, how healthy is the client? Five means, hey, we've got a goal over here. We're supposed to increase their pipeline by 25%. We are uh, at or above that, and we're continuing to trend up. has to be part of it. So that's the performance side. The other side is the relationship side. Yeah. So from a relationship level, if I call up Ryan today, and say, hey, I've got somebody who's thinking about working with us. They're in a business like yours. They're not really sure. You know, would you be willing to speak to them on our behalf? They're the person who like can't, can hardly let you finish. Like, I would love to have that conversation. And like, I've got all kinds of glowing things. You know, I'd happily leave you a testimonial or refer people over today in the right situation. That's a five. The flip side is like, hey, we're not hitting target. We're continuing to trend down, and the client is pissed. And you've got you know, you know gradations of that along this scale. Um, so standardizing that becomes super important, super important for your team because how you're going to use this score is in your weekly delivery team meeting or your meeting with your account managers that you have, uh, except for in a very, very small firm, you're not going to look at every single account every single week. What I'm looking for is places where someone's taken a turn down. There's a change yep. in score week over week. And yep. anybody who's a three or below will certainly make it onto the issues list. And we need to figure out, hey, what's what's happening, you know, we're unlikely to retain or upsell uh, or move this account uh, if it continues, uh, if it continues to trend the way that it's trending right now. Yeah. Well, let me ask, so r- real quick, the, the, um, the, so the health score, you know, obviously has a component of, are we, uh, you know, are we achieving what we set out to achieve? I love the objective stated out there and that's a, that's a thing you can get to, but so I love that. Are we hitting that? And then there's an element of like, do they, you know, do they, do they, do they like us? Right. Are we, are we, uh, you know, I, I, I like to, when I talk to our team, I say, I've got three questions to answer. Are they making money? That's their objective. Are we making money? That's our objective. And do they like us? Right. Like those are the three things that I care about. If those three things are yes, I feel great. So, um, but, but I guess they're, so the health score, 
is a little bit of an overlap with some of what I would learn uh, from an MPS as well, right? Like some of right. that is also. So how would you view the two of those like working Yeah, playing together? together. Yeah. So I view them kind of as like calibrating uh, okay. or the MPS score being a calibrator to client health. So MPS for anyone who's not familiar is the classic, you know, scale one to 10. How likely are you to refer this business to a colleague or friend or whatever that might be? And so nines and tens are our promoters, sevens and eights are passives, and then six and below are detractors. And we're measuring NPS by the percentage of people who are uh, promoters minus the percentage of detractors. Anyways, um, that NPS score, you know, I should never have somebody rated as a five. Hey, they're yeah. so thrilled. But it turns out they're actually also a five on MP, you know, like they're right, the exactly. the a disconnect. <laughs> so we need to keep, yeah, I gotcha. We need to keep our account managers accountable to because if once account managers, project managers, whatever you call that role, strategists, um, once they know, I don't have to discuss this and have this brought up in our weekly meeting as long as it's a four or a five and not changing down, you're going to get a whole lot of fours and fives, most likely. Um, I'd rather kick yeah. the can down the road in terms of having the hard conversations to fix this. And so we use a couple of things to try to calibrate that. Uh, one are, are rules like, hey, nobody should ever be churning other than, hey, COVID hit. And there's some totally unrelated thing that, that happened here. Nobody should be churning if you've given them a four or a five totally. uh, internally. Uh, secondly, that MPS score helps calibrate. Um, you know, I'm able to see and kind of check their realism. Yep. And then lastly, yep. I love having account managers do, depending on your retainer size um, or your deal value, either it's a, a consistent update at some specified frequency. So mm. often this is weekly. The reality is if you've got somebody in there on a $1,500 a month retainer, there's not enough time <laughs> sure, and sure. margin exactly. to go fill something out weekly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you, yeah. you got to use some common good. sense around this. But asking, these are my favorite four kind of leading questions or prompting questions is, why would the customer be unhappy? So you've got to, it's not just, is the customer happy, but why would they be unhappy? You're looking, mm -hmm. you have to train yourself to look for reasons that they're not happy. Are you personally, you know, is our team happy with the account? Any changes in strategy or time on that I should know about? And then what do you need help with on this account is the prompt to do that. And then they'll typically confirm some other details in whatever system they wind up using for this. this and is so great. It, it gives you like a week over week or whatever that frequency is, week over week yeah. view of, where did things where did things change? And most of the time, the answer is, hey, there's probably some action uh, coming yeah. out of this. Somebody needs help somewhere. Um, but a lot of this stuff, you know, we're just kind of able to check that health score and hold it in a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's just an efficient way to manage kind of how is our portfolio of clients doing when you're leading what can be a pretty large delivery team with a lot yeah. of client projects going on at a time. A couple of super granular uh, questions around uh, the NPS specifically. So one question I have, which is, what would you recommend as the frequency of the NPS? And we had another question from the group, which was, are you doing that at the company level or like the project level? Yep. So yeah, how do you think about that? Yeah, I would uh, typically tie this to the specific deal. So think of that as the project yeah. level rather than a yeah. client. I mean, we've yeah. worked with teams who have like, nine different divisions of Nike as clients. Totally. These are all and, different stakeholders. They have different totally emotions. different. Yeah, exactly. Mo most of the time in the agency space, this is one and the same. The client is the deal yep. is the same yep. thing. Yep. Uh, and then the second question was how frequently for MPS? Uh, I think if you're running a decent sized retainer project, every 90 days is great. If you're running a really tight, um, you know, a really tight, intense branding project or web project or something, 90 days is like, hey, we might get two scores out of here. It's not frequent enough. Um, and yeah. so whether it's NPS or using a customer satisfaction survey or some other way to try to get that feedback, it's got to be more frequent, probably already 30 days. Yep. Um, and then if you've got somebody, you know, someone's a website hosting customer and you're charging them 50 bucks a month, maybe you send this out, you know, yeah. once a year, twice yeah. a year. I'll tell you, I know I'm not the project management guru, but one thing that I, one thing that I do relative specific to MPS, uh, cause we obviously, we use a version of MPS for, for our practice. But one thing that I do either in the kickoff call or one of the early onboarding calls is I'll, I will let them know like, Hey, one of the things that we do is we seek NPS, right? And so 90 days from now, I'm going to sit here and I'm, and we're going to ask you the question, Hey, how likely are you to recommend? I'm a 10 out of a 10 guy. I love 10 out of 10. And I'm very hopeful that you are also going to feel 10 out of 10. 
what would be true? Like what must be true about this engagement? What would you be looking for? What, what, what does it feel like in order for you to put a 10 out of a 10? And I write that stuff down <laughs> and I yep. communicate whether, you know, that's, that's a, that's a key question. Cause it really, I mean, you know, I'm a big alignment person, right? Yeah. And so the more we can be very explicit about alignment, we can write down these things are true and we're going to use that. We're going to work to that. We're going to, we're going to set our, our output in the context of those things. Um, and it's also just kind of a subtle psychological way of like uh, 100%. You know, making it a little bit easier for, you know, for you to get the 10. So anyway, can I ask one follow? This is a little bit of a tangent, but I want to make yeah, a, I want to potentially make a point unless you give the wrong answer here. So no pressure with your answer. What do you <laughs> most often terrible. like you ask that question to me and you expect back the average answer. What's the average answer back? Is that if you had, if you had a bucket, oh, is oh, I, like, you were going to say, is that it felt like I was going to have a multiple choice or, well, so basically the, the two yeah. paths here are, is it kind of like, hey, I expect you to kind of deliver on everything you, you promised? Like if we just did that, that'd be great. Or is it, I also want this extra thing? It's always the latter. There's always, there's always, I mean, at least for me, I generally feel like there's a thing that was unsaid. Yeah. And, and, and it, again, in our world, like you're going to come to us because you care a lot about accounting operations or you care a lot about advisory. There's like a tip of the spear here. There's a reason. One of them is a, is a, is a, is a nice to have and in branding and, and strategy and all those, they have their own kind of versions yep. of those. Right. And I will come in thinking, I think it's probably this and of not trivial amount of the time I realize it was actually something else. I think right. people are quite poor at describing specifically uh, what, what they're looking for. And so when you phrase questions in different ways like this, you learn things that you didn't. So anyways, that's my experience. I don't know if that's hundred percent. Okay, good. <laughs> so No, I, I think, I think yeah. it's, it's like the expectations piece. Is there yeah. some expectation, some blank that they had filled in somewhere that you wouldn't have gotten without a better question, um, but you were able to uncover it, and that sets you up so much better in the delivery yeah. process. Yeah. Um, awesome. Great. Okay. So quick, quick time check. Uh, we've got a few, uh, actually, you know what, we're, we're, we're coming down towards the end. We do have a couple of questions out there. Uh, so why don't, here's one and I'm going back, uh, I'm going back in our presentation, but you described this burn down chart in, uh, you know, your, your click up demonstration related to to do's uh, what yeah. the question was, are you using the sprint feature for that? Or how are you doing the burn down chart? Correct. Yeah. So burn down charts are going to, are going to work if you've got a specific, uh, sprint piece. So most of that is click ups native, uh, sprint and sprint automation feature set. Uh, and some of that is some other custom stuff that we've built on top of it. Yeah, cool. Okay, and I think we actually hit the other one. Uh, the one, and I I think this is maybe an unfair uh, can to open with five minutes remaining, but I am going to do it, and we'll just get as as uh, we'll get as far as we can. But I, I, you know, one topic that you and I talked about that I'd really like to hit, which is just the concept of okay, great, we have all these things. It's a lot. There's a lot here. Um, can we make it easier on ourselves? Are there opportunities to templatize some of these things? Is there opportunity to introduce automation? Like how should people start to be thinking about those things? Yeah. So I think for the most part, uh, actually I'll, I'll tackle the templates piece first. Okay. Huge on templates. Templates get you all kinds of, you know, like uh, these are a good example in whatever tool you're using. Hey, I'm just seeing general account health right now. I'm seeing some threes and uh, some other scores here but I actually want to see it broken out by, you know, what status kind of, where are they in the, are they onboarding? Are they active? Or are they offboarding? What do health scores look like? Or I want to see it by different account managers for sure. I want to know, Hey, when Andrew manages account, what does that look like versus when Kevin does that? Okay. I'm starting to highlight uh, either who my best, you know, there might be different explanations for this, but um, kind of who are my best uh, account managers and worst account managers. Well, the ability to slice and dice this data or at the everything level, you know, I'm kind of up at a global view of what's going on and being able to slice and dice this and see it in different ways, all as a function of what properties we've put in. And this is the same whether you're using any of the other yep. uh, PM platforms. So templates are a great way to pre-fill a lot of that information and say, hey, we're doing onboarding. Here's what that looks like. Or we're doing SEO. You know, what should our processes around that? I guess I'm in uh, someone else's templates here. So if we go into or uh, like a, a blank set of templates here. Um, so the more that we can templatize yeah. and I'm huge on keeping this as simple as possible and trying to not overcomplicate it. Like what's the stuff that we know we're going to need to do. And then let's yeah. give them the, here's the quick bullet points. Um, but templates are a way, a great way to pre-fill a lot of, Hey, what are the, what are the other properties that we want to have to be able to pull whatever reporting we need? And so anytime we're working with a agency client, 
we start with the end and work backwards with like, hey, what are the metrics that we need visibility into to be able to yep. make better decisions to move them all yep. forward? Okay, here's now how we're going to have to design and architect the system to be able to pull that data back out. Now let's get into the actual process building and, and implementation type stuff. So uh, that'd be the first part. The second part, the automation side, you know, then you're getting into things like, hey, this is basically an ROI analysis. How often do we run something? How painful yep. is it today? And how expensive is it to build? And those are the three variables that we need to know to um to Speak my language okay, brother i love it no we don't <laughs> cool. so. i dig it awesome okay cool awesome i love it all right so i uh i think we're mostly at time so why don't we just quickly wrap up um so gray let me ask you this question uh just in terms of like if if folks are on this and they're thinking wow i have a lot of these problems and it sounds like this gray guy could really help us out like what's the best way like for them to reach you or get in touch with y'all or learn more like where should we send them yeah for sure so i think uh, two things. One, if you're ready to have a conversation with us and you just want someone to take a look at what you've got built now and help you map out what the best path for it is, uh, go to zenpilot.com slash call and book a call with um, with us. Um, if you've got other questions and you're curious, shoot me, dr- drop me a note at gray at zenpilot.com. I'd also say if you want to see like what does that holistic system look like in action, if you Google ClickUp for Agencies uh, or go check out this ClickUp for Agencies guide that we've got put together, um, that'll give you, now this is specifically in ClickUp, but a lot of the principles you could apply to any other system. We also have a teamwork.com for agencies guide, um, but the ClickUp for agencies guide has a video there that kind of walks through, hey, what is a day in life? Like through the lens of what does a day in the life of an agency look like? How should project management um, be run and what does it look like when it's done to a gold standard? Awesome. Love that. Cool. Well, first of all, and and from our perspective, a uh, couple of things uh, we're going to reverse it. So we're going to do another webinar where Greg gets a ch- ch- chance to ask the tough questions and I'll present and we'll take the other side of of, of uh, success, which is leaning more financial metrics. Um, so look for, we'll go ahead and let everybody know when we got a date solidified for that. We've got another webinar coming up. Uh, Upsource and Parallax are partnering to talk about the KPIs that really matter. That's coming up at, uh, I think it's one o'clock on Wednesday of next week, but Caroline put a link in the chat. Um, and obviously you're, by all means, same same offer. If you have any questions related to any of these things, you want to reach out to us directly, rwatson at upsourceaccounting.com. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Um, and thanks for everybody for joining. It's been a lot of fun, Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. This was a blast to dig into together and look forward to the next one. Awesome. All right. Take care. Out.